this, this is sorry, that was so loud. This is a um, a pretty niche idea, obviously, with mobile bone cancer manufacturers, but this particular event is the first Tuesday of the month of it that we do every first Tuesday. So uh, it's a news before bruise event. So if you aren't familiar with it, on the first Tuesday here at Westgate every month of Supper of July, we have a knowledge sharing uh, presentation in some sort of concentrated technology or some sort of relevance within the ecosystem here. So, so that's kind of what we're doing. The intent is to is to make some collaborative efforts to introduce you to people to become an intersection with industry, academia, government. So, so that's kind of what we're doing here. This is this is a small group. So uh, normally we have a pretty large group here, but but I realize that this is in-person events are 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 you know they're not as black and white as they used to be. So people are coming where they're not. So we are recording this, and you will also get a copy of the presentation when we are finished or by tomorrow. So you can be able to watch it in the presentation as well and share it with others who think that might be able to do it. So um, today I, I want to introduce you to Kyle Spoolis. He is the technology acceleration specialist with Purdue Manufacturing Partnership, Extension Partnership, and Malachi Gred, who is with Elite Automation, which is a system integrator out of Evansville to speak on mobile robots for manufacturers. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Kyle for some quick information on the Purdue Extension Partnership. But then we'll get we'll get to uh, Malachi's presentation right after that. Okay, and I think he does have a demo as well. So after we are done here, then we will go into the lobby, and there'll be some uh, like food and drinks, and you can be able to see the demo. And I can kind of show you what's going to go on there too. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Kyle Spolis with Purdue MEP. Uh, show of hands who's familiar with our group or worked with us in the past a little bit. Okay. Yeah, so we are a nonprofit outreach program that uh, we work with pretty much exclusively manufacturers in the state of Indiana, upwards of 600 different companies a year, um, generally in these three areas. So what makes us unique is we're, uh, we'll come on site to you. Uh, so even you know, during the past crazy two years, we were on site, except for about three or four months there uh, with permission. Um, and we do offer um, public workshops as well, so you can buy a ticket and come with multiple companies to an EDC in your county or something that's more convenient for you uh, for a one-day session, for a series of sessions, uh, for example, Six Sigma Black Belt, if you want to get that program, we, we have a handful of guys that are master black belts that get on that training. So um, we're interested in, in helping the state of Indiana manufacturing uh, everybody's uh, competitive nature uh, rise and with the labor crisis going on right now we're focused a lot on automation sources and particularly flexible automation and how to offer the solutions to people that maybe have overlooked it in the past because they thought it wasn't for them that they were automotive or really high volumes and now there's some technology out there that is in reach for them so that's kind of what we're here to do is to bring that closer to them and, and de-risk that a bit so i'll talk a little bit about how that works uh, so right now we have a program uh, from federal government, uh, NIST, National Institute for Standards and Technology, and with that mission, so they, they kind of had some foresight before all this went down, the, you know, the labor shortage wasn't getting any better even in 2019, and allowed a, a series of states, uh, Iowa, uh, Illinois, and Indiana, to uh, basically perform the no-cost automation assessments, do some project management, uh, various activities, um, all the efforts of de-risking automation adoption for, again, small and medium-sized companies, typically under 250 employees. That's usually who we work with. Um, what that looks like is you know, usually initial phone call, just to make sure that um, there's some level of understanding of automation and, and some of the, uh, I would say pitfalls, but some of the uh, applications that are better suited, uh, some that are not. Um, we like to look at the place to see if, if they're ready to automate or really the processes are kind of broken and need more of a, a lean um, consultant to come in and fix the broken processes because we don't want to automate waste. Uh, so we spend a lot of time doing that, working in the areas of lean and quality and, and leadership. Uh, but now with the, the focus on automation because of the labor shortage, we're bringing that lean mindset to automation and looking at it with uh, this kind of fresh set of eyes and bringing some of these technologies like Mount Kai's going to demonstrate later with mobile robots, um, maybe work with these companies. So, 
look at competitive quotes. So kind of a liaison project manager, just trying to be more, uh, you know, everybody's got a lot of their plate doing more with less and try to be a, uh, that extension of your company to scout technology, to build relationships with systems integrators, uh, distributors of the technology. So it's just a little bit easier and maybe more in reach for, for companies than you this is kind of what a little fuzzy screen's a little dark, but sample page of the report. We, we get into what are the drivers of the automation. Um, sometimes this highlights where some um, process improvement might be warranted versus just throwing automation at it and trying to throw money at it for a fix. Uh, we, we, we don't want to automate waste, right? So we have we have that lean mindset really from day one. Um, we'll give you a payback in ROI analysis with a budgetary number of. What's a cobot going to cost? What's an efficient system going to look like? You need conveyors. You need to redo your part presentation system, safety, kind of but all these line items that need to be factored in rather than just what's an AMR cost or what is a piece of software cost. It's kind of a, try to give it as much of a big picture kind of look. Does the company have to be established or could it be a startup? As long as they um, are established and, and are a manufacturer and have a mix, what's called a mixed code. Um, so there's hundreds of these codes in there in Indiana, then uh, they are being served. Yep. Um, again, showing like cobots. Cobots were initially a focus, but we're getting into more traditional automation with smaller robots. Um, not doing multi million dollar cells. That's, that's usually for you know, systems integrators and they're helping with that. But, but for example, one that we did was a company, Terra Hope, first robot. Um, they had a whole slew of CNC machines that were empty. And they're just opportunity costs. They're just losing money every day because they don't have an operator to run them. So they're plugging in the first, um, they went with a, a, a bigger uh, industrial robot with collaborative programming. But they had no idea kind of what questions to ask and, and, and what all was going to change from having a person do that, loading and unloading, quality checks and deburring versus now just having that robot on do it. So we're trying to um, work with them on a two-day program and establish a foundation and we and then did a full value stream map with what they were doing, where they are going to be at. And then like an ideal state, like five years down the road where it's fully automated and that robot is doing all these tasks on the list. Okay, so it's kind of doing it in phases, phase rollouts. A lot of that's driven with cost and complexity with the integrator. But um, that's that's a good illustration of how we how we work with those folks. Um I'll show you a quick slide here. Uh you know, you've got all these things around the cobot in this case, and that's really the challenge. It's, the robot is pretty established by now. Now, cobots are newer, but still the basic programming and movement are very precise, right? Very predictable. Um, it's, it's making everything handshake and work together that is the challenge. And so that's where we're, we're trying to we try to educate people. We, we can do some proof of concepts for them um, offline. Again, just all about de-risking it and saying, is this is this going to be right for you? Basically doing everything up until a full install. We're even going to be rolling out a demo program here shortly uh, where people can try it for 60 to 90 days uh, in, in a simple application and see if it's going to work for them. So um, having that whole solution. This is the diagram I wanted to show. So I generally kind of fit in the center here. Um, I'm not a systems integrator, but I work with somebody like Malachi to um, identify the scope, what these people want to achieve with this. Is it a quality issue? Are they wanting the lights out? Um, are they just growing so fast they just can't keep up and they just need to plug in a robot and go as fast as possible? You know, what's the goal? Um, Purdue as a whole has always been really heavily, Purdue MVP has been um, heavy into lean manufacturing expertise, so we're bringing that expertise to it. I mentioned it was like a two-day session where I worked with the machine shop in Terre Haute. And then we've got the distributors of the equipment. So talking to them, hey, is this the right size robot? What's the speed? What kind of gripper does it need? Um, does it handshake with all these vision systems and conveyors? You know, what else do they need to be thinking about? Give me some budgetary numbers and then you know might work with an, an integrator to put a, a full proposal together, right? So the distributor would sell the equipment to to medium most cases, right? So that's kind of a little bit of how that works and how we look at it and try to get people to adopt. 
um, this sample, you know, what that can look like. Now, a lot, of, a lot of times right now, it's not a battle of what does an operator cost versus a robot. It's like, what's what am I losing in dollars in lost revenue because I don't have anybody and I can't find anybody for months to, to work at that machine. So what's that number look like hourly versus the cost of a robot that's generally, especially a cobot, generally under ten dollars an hour. You know, so um, be very competitive. But we go through all these things and in the report, spell all this out as much as we can, break it down um, for the customer to understand. Again, a lot of people are doing this themselves, uh, just trying to take as much off of the plate or you know, bring that extra effort um, to get you closer to making a decision about spending your own valuable time and effort. So this one didn't need it. This one did the, the uh, the ROI requirement from the company. So we like to talk about that up front, uh, whether it's uh, a people are very strict, like you gotta be 18 months or less. Some people it's like, yeah, three years is generally what we like to see, you know, it varies. So we want to present the right size solution, right? It's, uh, depending on what their expectation is from uh, not only capital investment level, but also what they expect to gain uh, in a payback period in, in our lives. So. Um, and just lastly, this so this is important, I think, from a really cost leaving cost out of it. We like to start with the low complexity applications, but usually we'll learn uh, a lot of things and be better suited to go to the next thing that maybe has more impact. Like in this case, the laser mark bending had a lot more impact, but the roll bend and deeper was a lot simpler. And so uh, let's let's start there. If we've got the money to do both, let's start with the one on the right. And the, the learning curve will be shorter, and, and hopefully the uh, uh, experience and, and overall effectiveness of the second deployment will be uh, more robust and effective. So that's what we did part of the report uh, that we put together for the time. Um, any questions on how we work together with people in industry and how to qualify as a company or what all we can and can't do? So how, how do you choose vendors, robot vendors? Yeah, good question. So we we have a, uh, so MEP, first off, is we're all work from home basically throughout the state. So I'm in south the south side of Indianapolis. We have folks in every corner of the state. So we're not in Los Angeles yet, for the most part. Um, we do have a lab in Carmel where we have a, a cobot uh, being distributor uh, who also works with a platform called Vention. Um, and so we do work with them from time to time, but they don't do everything. They don't do welding, they don't do painting and, and uh, dispensing. So there's some applications that are, they just won't do. So depending on where the lead comes from, if somebody calls up from Malachi or somebody calls up Allied Automation or NEF or whomever, and, and we talk to talk to those folks and say, hey, um, you know, if you want to be a part of any assessments, if you go out and do that with people, we, we'd like to do that. And, Hopefully that's a, a value that your customer sees or that you see. And then we, we work with that company in, in their product line, right? So we, you know, we prepare depending on where we, um, where our leads come from. But yeah, we have several relationships, including you are a near brand. Um, there's a competing cobot brand that we work with from, from time to time. So we do work with multiple parties. But you tell me we're a fan shop and I want to deal with fan and we'll talk to fan. So one example I'll, I'll talk to Toyota is another you know, four five of them basically. Um, even uh, evenly distributed tasks, right? Right. So if you're bottleneck, we, we don't want to make the automation the bottleneck choke. Exactly. Especially the automation, 
Well, and, and Toyota is really good about watching how you do it. And then correct it. So if they're saying something, it's not our next question. When you talk about the ROI, have you tracked your track record of ROI? In other words, let's say you do an assessment. Oh boy, two years, these guys are going to make a lot of money back easily. How close are you track record wise with the mark? Yeah. And do you have some success stories that go above that? Because if you think about it, you're sitting there doing nothing, you got 10 cities in each number, you know, you're just bleeding cash back then. So, yeah, what kind of metrics have you guys collected? Yeah, we do, uh, we do have customer stories now with automation. This is all fairly new. Yeah, yeah. for us, not, not for the world, but for our center. Um, well, on this scale, on the small scale, you're working on it. Yeah, it is. Well, Following the last two years we've had, yeah, it's very good time. It's not exactly. Yeah. Um, we do have a customer who did a mobile robot uh, install in this area. Yeah, and I say I want to say they're probably six to nine months in, and they've been pretty willing to communicate. So far, they they said, you know what? Other than a fork truck running into it, uh, it's gone pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> so they were down for a few weeks just doing that repair, and that that's another thing we thought about. It's like you still, even if it's a cobalt or even if it's a new with all these you know, lidar systems that are you know uber safe, you still need to do a safety assessment, educate. Yeah. The, the people around it of what you know, best practices look like. We need a repair. Okay, yeah. so you non profit? Or we are. Or yeah. Profit? We are. Yeah. But to your point, I've seen some assessments in the past, and I know those can get pretty wishy washy on them. They paint a nice rosy picture. Mm -hmm. It's You don't get the immigration costs rolled into, you don't get the uh, you know, the 15, 20 percent um, utilities, the consumables, downtime, whatever you want to throw in there. Uh, there's a lot of other things than just the base price. So well, it's, they're not humans, but like you know, yeah, there's a different things. Right. It's right. Something goes wrong. You're not watching it. Yeah. Have mm -hmm. something that raises an alarm. Yeah. False. Yeah. Yeah, your question about lean, and, um, we were able to take out you know, less than a half day. We took uh, it was right at half their cycle time just because they were doing things unrelated to automation that we really didn't need to be doing. And so rather than have a robot do those things, we said, can you do this over in shipping, like their packaging right there? Let's, let's get that away. They were having to blow off. You know, have an excess blow off because sure. the CNC didn't have enough air capacity to do that. So there's, you know, there's things like that. You, you keep asking, why do you do it that way? Why does it have to be this way? Those kinds of things that people just lose track of. It gets so narrow focus and when it's fresh at eyes. A lot of times, well, it sounds like you use this opportunity to still so one just a general idea for mechanics. Then you have to have specific skill set and robots. Exactly. Exactly. That's kind of where I, I I know enough about several things. I don't know. I'm not an expert like, like this gentleman is, but that's where I get stuck. I call him. But but yeah, we have the lean experts and kind of the technology side together. We kind of bring that solution to it. Yeah. successful deployment rather than going at it alone, which can be scary and risky. More expensive if you're fully Right? That never happens. <laughs> So, cool. Well, thank you. Uh, I'll turn it over to you. Do you want to? Kyle, did you did you ask if can we just go around since there's not that many here and, and kind of who they are and what oh, they're? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I'm Samantha Nelson. I didn't introduce myself long ago. I'm the program manager here at Westgate, so so I apologize. But I thought we don't normally do that, but since since this might be good for Malachi and, and Kyle to know a little bit more, so yeah, it's okay. I do have some information up here. Uh, if you want to grab my card with there as well, we can talk afterwards. But there's take a pen if nothing else. But yeah, there's, there's a little bit more information on what we do. Yeah. 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 I'm Jenna. Um, I'm the sales manager at Blade Automation. 
I'm Stephen Green. I work at Vitech. I'm partner chair for the uh, robotic side and all of our advanced manufacturing. So I just wanted to kind of come in and see this robot. My name is Mike Furry, and uh, I'm a specialist. I work at Crane. Senator Fia, I work at Crane and like a uh, work. In a small amount of our time, work on um, autonomous robots for a robot competition called Director's Club at Queen. My name is Jerry Winhold. I have been around machine design at Jasper and the metal machine shop at Jasper. I do a lot of Work for integrators as far as end of arm tool pedestals. Basically, the entire robot cell out of the robot. I've designed a lot of it, I made a lot of it. Uh, you know, that's why I'm here to meet the people interested in integrating. Oh, Morgan Tavis, I'm the marketing manager here for Purdue OSA. Yeah. I'm Doug Brower, uh, territory manager with Nitrex. Uh, we're a heat treating service specializing in uh, nitriding. We do a lot with uh, aerospace and higher end industry, so always interested in what's going on in manufacturing and robotics. Brian McDonald, we're some inventors. Uh, I'm the director of business development, automation, big uh, requests for different clients, and it's always are you having issues getting in? Okay. Because um, it, you should, your computer should have just hooked up to the projector. No? My computer dash was, or I have to sign in. And even though they're from Purdue Manufacturing, Manufacturing Extension Partnership, and we actually work for the Purdue Research Foundation, which manages this facility, we have a lot of other university partnerships. So we have dealt with Rose Coleman in the past, IU, ISU, IUPUI, Notre Dame. So, so we definitely are, are, we're partial to Purdue because they pay us, but in terms of research and technology and, and innovation, we are partnerships with a lot of other universities, even VU. Um, so it's a lot of different things. Yeah, I mentioned, I mentioned our lab in Carmel. So uh, you're, you're invited in to utilize a training space like this, but then next door to it is uh, really their, their lab that they do projects as well as uh, demonstrations. So we have uh, reprinting, uh, virtual reality, augmented reality. We have a wearable safety device, which is interesting. It's cloud connected. Um, very affordable rate. Uh, came out of Iowa. The Iowa MD has turned on to them. Um, all about safety, slip and falls, noise, and air pollution, all those good things. So, anybody that has a, a safety a team uh, is interested in that, happy to talk to you about that further. Uh, but then the cobots and the robots are big pieces. So, one recent, uh, recent project we did was uh, cobot building. Uh, corrugated box that was, I want to say six by eight by eight, and setting it down at a conveyor and having it automatically taped. So it was, it was at a food bank in Indianapolis that is now packing all these daily uh, fresh produce um, boxes for people and distributing these boxes all throughout the Midwest. This is like the central hub. And they are just throwing labor at it, literally just using temps, and they don't know who's going to show up that day. And it's a it's a very grueling job and they've got a ton of demand. So they put it put the cobot right next to the folks. Good to go. And uh, they're they're gonna start with one and for you know 50 grand or less, I think they were able to do this project. And we're gonna hopefully do a bunch of these folks in the full boxes and that's really good stories. So everybody builds boxes, that's the universal, you know, case for a lot of production houses. So we're hoping to expand on that. But that's just one thing we can we can 
do with folks like that that really are the leading integrators to have technology build out real life examples of how it works for a lot of manufacturers. So. With restaurants at all? Or? Not yet. Robot chefs. Yeah, that's, I know several of those are working with test kitchens that are doing that as soon as they're back. Yes. Okay, yeah, so uh, this presentation is going to be over AMR technologies. The reason why we chose this is because there's a huge gap in, in manufacturing for AMR type technologies. Uh, it's a newer technology that hasn't been around before. and um, it's flexible. It's a, it's a flexible, um, it's a flexible operation that you can add to your facility, and it has a ton of different dynamics on how you can go about it. Like so uh, we lead we lead automation. Uh, our systems integrators, our core business model is robotic cells and really anything automation. So really focus on the technology side of things. Uh, I'm Alec Igro, CEO and owner of uh, the Automation. Also, my background is in uh, controls engineering. So pretty much my entire career, uh, I've done controls, started off doing risk assessment type of work, and then uh, kind of worked my way into project management and things along those lines. So I decided that I started to do that. Um, so what, what are AMRs? Um, AMR stands for Autonomous Mobile Robot. Uh, and basically what an AMR is, is, it gives you the ability to navigate within a facility uh, autonomously. And we've had AGVs, which are similar type of technology. The difference between an AGV and an AMR is an AGV always required track on the ground. So you had to put like a magnetic strip or a paint strip and had to detect that that uh, that strip in order to have a path to travel on. So it's almost the same as putting rails on the ground, uh, just a little bit easier to implement. Uh, and, and one of the issues with that is if you want to make a bunch of different decisions, like if you're going to leave this doorway uh, and, or you want to take a left, you would have to uh, You'd have to have two different strips, one going out the door, one going left. And then after you've made that decision to go left, you a lot of times don't have the ability to, to go reverse, especially if you have kind of like a train loop where there's another unit right behind it. So then you would have to do something along the lines of come all the way back around the entire loop before you make the decision to shoot off in another direction. Um, whereas AMR is stop in the track, decide to turn around and go, go to a completely different direction. Um, AMRs like AGPs uh, do have wireless signals where you're able to communicate data to them to be able to locate where they're at the facility and also uh, command them from lines like get them, like PLCs or uh, if you have any like office infrastructure that can call upon uh, AGP type of systems. So Premier in particular, they use a uh, SLAM technology, which is uh, some of the localization and mapping. And basically what that means is as the AMR is driving around, it's it's learning its environment, it's learning where it's at. So whenever you first teach your initial map, you turn on mapping, you drive it around, and uh, it locates all the different things within the room. Well, the thing that's really nice about this is after you get play and you put it into production, it's constantly looking at the area and seeing how it's changing. So if you just take that trash can and you just move it here in the center of this room, uh, it would then navigate around it as long as you had your paths taught where it's allowed to do that. You can restrict it for safety reasons to not take paths around. But uh, it will navigate around that object and then re the remapping of this is over time, it'll learn that that object is always there. If it continues to be there, it'll learn that it's always there. And so whenever it comes, whenever it goes to make its path, it'll go ahead and anticipate that that's gonna be there and go around it. 
And so then remove the, the object, it's it's possible that it, whenever it goes for its first cycle again, that it's going to uh, try to go around again as if it's still there. But then after a cycle or two of it noticing it's not there anymore, it'll start doing its uh, straight, more efficient path. Um, by the way, anybody has any questions they can, find, they can ask as well. This is just basically kind of a line part of different manufacturers of AMR right now. Um, majority of AMRs kind of utilize the same technologies. They're either using laser scanners or uh, LIDAR systems to detect their areas and uh, localize themselves. They also pretty much all have uh, encoders built into the wheels. So it's using the encoder data as the wheels uh, travel or as the AMR travels. And then it's also using, it's either LIDAR sensors or laser scanners. And a lot of these have laser scanners that you've utilized in your facilities like SIG, GANs, they're just regular safety laser scanners. Um, and, and they're actually programmable. So if you need to get in there and, and adjust them, for some reason you do have access to be able to, uh, to program the laser sensors, at least within the uh, I can't speak on a lot of the brands. Uh, AMRs are becoming such a big thing that they're in all different types of industries. It's not just manufacturing. I really like kind of present this slide just to show kind of the use case and just like how adaptive these things are. Uh, so you obviously you have your logistical, you have manufacturing, which I think most of us are here for today. And then you're getting into things which in my mind are, are very innovative things like healthcare, agriculture. Uh, these things are going to have a huge, huge impact in the market. And this is this kind of explains that right here. So right now, AMR is in the 1.97 uh, billion market cap, projected to grow to 87 billion by 2028 at a 23% growth rate. And then we have another study that says that they're going to hit 75 billion by 2027. And then it's expected to double past that by 2028. Um, in reality, I think we're it's probably more likely to be in the 75 billion because it's such a new technology that it hasn't even really been adopted yet. And, it, and also, there's the different industries that it can be within. Like you just say, manufacturing alone is easily going to climb above 2 billion. If you, then you include stuff like your agriculture, your healthcare, and healthcare can be huge. You know, the doctor's office everywhere, there's hospitals everywhere. Um, and this is, you know, part of the reason why we're in, in this space is because we want to be like pioneers of innovation. We want to be doing, working with the newest equipments. And as a company, there's a possibility maybe we don't stay 100% manufacturing. Maybe we do start implementing some of this AMR for hospitals and whatnot. Another uh, huge advantage to AMR is their, their ability to implement them quickly. Um, we're going to go out here in a little bit and kind of do a demonstration starting from scratch and show you how quick we can get up one of these up and running. Uh, I'm not saying you can 100% get your whatever your operation is up and running in 20 minutes, but we can do a quick demonstration where we can have it be run some cycles within 20 minutes, um, maybe even less. It, then the next big thing is uh, the redeployment, right? Uh, you're able to, to take this AMR, and if you decide you don't want to use them for a process anymore, you can deploy it to another process, uh, maybe another, another line. Uh, it can be a completely different process, right? You can retool it to, to uh, be whatever the new process needs are. Another huge thing uh, with the modularity is that when you implement more than one AMR in your system, you can now have either different AMRs that are outfitted with uh, permanent fixtures, or you can have kind of like a tool change type of operation. So when I get into, I'll probably explain a little bit more as I get further down the road, uh, you'll have some more visuals along with its adaptability. So I'm gonna go ahead and start off by showing you guys a couple of uh, videos. Right, 
Do not play the video for this thing. Put a slideshow in the right here. Fix up that and go back to it. So uh, here's a version of a, a tutter system. Uh, so, now, some tutter systems, they're set up to have their, their AMR system and then also have their own parts to go with it. Maybe you can adapt the top side of the, of the AMR, but uh, some of them you have to buy the, the AMR with their, their home entire tutter system. Other ones uh, are more customizable, more adaptive, uh, and you can kind of create whatever the customized solution you need for the process. Then go back. You go back to the slide itself. Uh, this right here is a, a palletizing AMR. So this is where we have a presentation and I'll show kind of a more detailed version of what this uh, type of operation can give you. But so this could be something as simple as bringing individual pallets to uh, workers. It could be bringing an individual pallet to a robot cell. It could be bringing entire stacks of pallets to, to a robot cell. Um, and the, the thing with this is you can have a lot of cost savings with the AMR just by having less equipment. So let's say, for instance, if you had a, a palletizer, uh, like a pallet key stacker, and you had one of those for each one of your robot cells, you're able to now just have one centralized location for a pallet stacker, have your AMR do the delivering of a single pallet or a stack of pallets. And, uh, and and then mitigate having the pork truck driver have to go back to the warehouse and, and bring the stack of pallets to the line. Now this AMR can, can handle that entire process. Here's a, a video of, a, of AMR that has a, it's out there with the conveyor top module. Um, and, and so the, the premise of this application here is that these presses are like 30 feet away from each other, right? And the operator has plenty of cycle time to sit there for two, three minutes, um, tending one press, but with the presses being so far away, they don't quite have the cycle time to run back and forth between two presses. And on top of that, you kind of have the ergonomic uh, aspects of having a human walk 30 feet back and forth uh, throughout an eight-hour shift or 12-hour shift, how many hours we're working. Um, so what we're able to do here is we're able to bring the single part over to the other press. So that way they're able to take uh, their operation from, from 50%. So going from two operators to one operator. And for a, for a place that has 20 presses, you just went from needing 20 employees to needing 10 employees. And this, this right here is implemented in like two weeks. We were able to, from, from PO to, to having this on site, site operating, 10 weeks. Um, And then I'm going to go ahead and dive back into the adaptability. Okay? So uh, one of the ways that you can have these, these AMRs really modular and adaptive is, let's say, for instance, this operation right here, you didn't need to perform very often. Maybe you're moving an entire pallet of something, right? Well, you can have this one AMR, move this whole entire pallet, take it to another area, drop that pallet off, and then it becomes like a full change area. And then they can drop off the entire conveyor module from itself. Now there's more outfitting that has to be done on that side of things, 
but you could have it drop that off for uh, maybe a different style uh, palletizing uh, platform, or you could have a hook that could go on onto the AMR, uh, or maybe even just different conveyor types, right? Maybe like this operation, you're, you're moving an individual part, but you also want this AMR to pick up entire pallets of a product. And so that adaptability is, is huge. And then you kind of get into one of the next advantages of having fleets of these systems, okay? So with, with Mir, they have a fleet system. Uh, and with that fleet system, it does all of the scheduling of what the AMR is supposed to do. So uh, us as systems integrators, we'd come in, that, come in and we would say, okay, this has a top module, uh, a conveyor top module, this has a palletizing module, this has a hook on it. Um, and we would tell the fleet software what AMR has what, what's out there with what. And let's say first you had five, five of these AMRs with uh, conveyor top modules. Uh, the fleet knows that it has those five and it can do stuff like delegate this AMR to go charge because maybe it's at a lower battery percentage. And then these other four can just stay active or maybe the three of them keep it up with the line, the line rate is somewhat slower. So the, you know, a fourth one parks and just waits until, until maybe the, the line uh, reaches a high enough demand that it needs uh, all five AMRs in the process. And then as far as, uh, you know, mapping the, the AMR to doing multiple processes, like let's say for instance, with this particular application, if you're running a smaller part number, you could essentially go around three different presses, get that, receive that part number or that part onto this AMR, go to, so you go to three different presses and receive the parts of each one of those presses, and then take it to a, a fourth person. So right now we're actually in discussion of a company doing something similar to this, and almost one lights out with their entire catch mold process. So essentially this type of process we're going to go to a centralized trimming and uh, packing location and they're going to basically be able to do this with i think it's eight amrs to, to, to 10 like 20 presses uh, so it's going to be a huge huge cost reduction and on top of that that opens up more capabilities to, to what we can do in the next process so right now we're just coming to a centralized uh, location uh, but from that, you can do creative things like a robot cell, and then maybe you don't have ROI for one robot cell to tend this this line here, but you you do have ROI for that one robot cell to tend three different lines, right? And how do you do that? We well, can you have the part delivered from each line to the one robot cell, uh, and then have that robot be adaptive and, and able to, to handle the different part numbers that you want to throw at it. And that's especially advantageous for uh, companies that have similar parts or or can or parts can be handled uh, in a similar fashion. What's the typical charging time? So uh, typical charging time is for oh, let me get right for twenty minutes of time. It's actually one of the next slides. Mm -hmm. There's actually right there. There you go. Yeah. So. Uh, for two hours, the charge time you get 13 hours, which is a long amount of charge time. But what's actually a little more impressive is off with 10 minutes alone, you get two hours of charge time at 40 minutes. So that's a pretty big deal, especially when you get to a point where you do three AMRs and this one can go charge itself while these other two stay in operation. And, and this, the reason this is like this is because. The, the nature of batteries. Whenever they're at a lower percentage, uh, they can accept the charge quicker versus when they're when they're closer to their full, the charge rate slows down. Um, with with Mir, they have a built-in dashboard. Uh, your the dashboard basically operates as an HMI. Uh, so you can have this dashboard either set have, have it set up for like a maintenance purposes for somebody who needs to to teach new positions or uh, really jog, jog it around if you're pretty much in the screen. Uh, but maybe you have something like your IOs uh, on this dashboard. But then the other big thing is you can set this up uh, to be an operator interface. 
uh, with, with this being an operator interface, you can operate it with phone, tablet, which have, tablets actually one of the, the big use cases of it. So instead of going with, you know, Alan Bradley, $3,000 HMI, uh, you can put a $500 tablet in there uh, to, to operate the, the AMR system. And, you know, if it does get broke, you know, it's $500. Uh, it's, it's a lot, a lot cheaper to, to replace than, than an out of the HMI. Uh, also, too, like in reality, it's in the pretty durable. Where my kids play that. <laughs> uh, yeah, just the flexibility of just being able to log in uh, with, with pretty much any device and be able to control the AMR uh, is huge. The, uh, you're able to also connect the AMR to your plant network. So if you have a fleet system at half scale plant network, uh, if, you, uh, if you're not using a fleet system, all of you can do that locally in, inside the, the single AMR. But if you put this thing on your, your plant network or a lot of companies have AGB networks or an AMR network, uh, where these things reside on the network by themselves, uh, then you're able to, uh, from your office, if you have connection to that, that AMR network, you can log directly into whatever AMR is on your shop floor. And then, and then, so it's like point, point five. Yep, point five. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, so like a lot of, a lot of companies sort of will have uh, basically wireless hubs all throughout the facility or just where they need the Wi Fi. So that's actually another thing uh, to keep in mind is at least with Mir, if I gave the mirror command to go downstairs here into the lobby, and we had internet in this room, and we had internet downstairs, but not in between, it can still do that. As long as it can receive the command here and, and send whatever command it needs to send once it gets down there, then uh, it can still function without having Wi-Fi. And so that'd be for like a company that maybe has a, a massive facility and they don't want to spend the, the money for infrastructure or putting internet or Wi-Fi all across their, their plant, especially if they're doing like a type of like warehouse and logistics where it's a massive plant and kind of just a big open area. But how does the robot know it's or does it know if it received a package? Yeah, so your your robot will know uh, if it received a package by two different methods. Um, either some signal from uh, some signal from a PLC that can also be communicated over Ethernet or over uh, Wi Fi. Uh, and, and with uh, AMR, with Mir, I mean, they use uh, REST API and then they also use uh, Modbus TCP. So if you have a PLC that can communicate Modbus TCP and send the signal over Wi Fi to, to the Mir. Um, that's actually really powerful. and Kind of going off topic a little bit, one thing that we'll actually do on systems like this, if we have to do anything that's complicated at all, we'll actually put our own wireless module uh, on the AMR system, like on our control cabinet, and then uh, put an Allen Bradley remote I.O. inside that cabinet. So now we communicate with Allen Bradley PLC to that onboard Allen Bradley uh, remote I.O. module. So that way you have the function, functionality of Allen Bradley PLC on top on one of these AMR systems. Because um, where these are uh, good to implement quickly, uh, one of their downfalls is they're not super advanced. And they kind of, they have a little bit more of like a, a structured text type of programming, similar to robot. It's, it's very similar to robot, but they also don't have a lot of advanced uh, a lot of advanced capabilities within their normal user interface. Uh, it's kind of going to communicate protocols, uh, communicates a mod bus, and then also REST API. REST, REST API is a uh, basic communication protocol that a lot of, I don't say offices use it, but it's a, it's a protocol that uh, how do I put it? Say for instance, like a lot of like website software and stuff like that talk to it. So like you'll see like web development, we use stuff like REST API to be able to, to send data. Like you wanted 
I think you mentioned something about um, lean manufacturing, right? Going from, uh, you know, how do you how do you make the process more lean? You're going from uh, just in time type of ordering system. Well, this is you know, one of those ways. You have your you have essentially your website talks to the REST API to the AMR that says, hey, go pick up that order. Hey, you update your lines to from your website to schedule what your line is going to be doing. Um, and then also passing this information over to your to your nearest door. Uh, this right here is the uh, path protocol that uh, is essentially what I was talking about before. So if you create a strict market following, uh, the AMR will stop and then it'll be down until somebody comes in and services it. Uh, generally, you don't want to do this like path did. Unless you're presenting some type of safety hazard or some other workflow issue, uh, you don't want your AMR just to stop. Uh, you can also you go with a semi strict line following, uh, which will give you the ability to go around it. And this is a variable uh, setting change that you can open up and close based on uh, a lot of different things. You can have areas in your, in your uh, you can set up zones in your map that says, hey, this area over here. Uh, it's a restricted zone that I want you to go in there at all. Or, hey, this area right here, I want you to only stay within this area when tra while traveling here. Or this is the preferred zone, this is the non-preferred zone, then it'll only take that, that non-preferred preferred zone if uh, there's an obstacle in the way. So that way you can, say for instance, like walkway, it's always going to be a, a do not enter zone. Um, and then preferred zones are, are really important too, because if you know in your mind, like this is the process flow we want of our, our, our automation and our AMR system, uh, you can give it the, the zones and also the paths saying, this is the way I prefer you to, to uh, execute your, your missions. There's just a couple images of uh, some of the applications that we've done. Really the, the Two applications on the top side and one that we know as well. There's a 3D model that we put together uh, of a system that uh, is basically showing the AMR being utilized in uh, in within a robotic cell. Uh, so you have your end feed line coming in the boxes, you're tending your pallets by an AMR system, and then whenever your AF, whenever your pallets get full, they traverse off onto your to your AMR system that takes them to whatever storage location you may have or whatever your next process. Maybe it's a maybe it's a, a wrapping machine, right? And this wrapping machine would be a perfect example of like call savings. Maybe you have six robot cells and you either got to convey all of these pallets to the uh, to the wrapping station or uh, you have that pork truck manually take them over there and load them into the wrapping station. Uh, and then you have the option of, of doing an AMR system that can take it over to the wrapping station. And it can, you know, uh, run it through its wrapping station, have the, the wrapping station run it back off to it, and then take it to where its final, final packet destination is your warehouse. And just another image of uh, this cell. Do you have any questions on this? Don't have any particular questions or sir. How would we easily modify our programs on the AMR? Is that something that a customer can themselves, or is that something where you can call back in to modify the program? They can they can easily modify the program. Yeah. So for, for yeah, I realistically the value add of, of a system integrator needing to do this application is like initial setup stuff and probably the initial engineering. Um, really, if, we, if us as systems integrators were to say, hey, here's the package, here's the, here's the you know, uh, controls cabinet that goes with the conveyor, um, plug it into here, you know, basically we just give you that AMR with that top module and everything on it. And have all the um, IO modules set up. 
in reality, we're not needed for a lot. There are like some optimization things that we you know, can do with systems integrators that um, maybe an end user doesn't either have the skill set to do or the like authorization to do. Um, but yeah, super easy. It's definitely one of the major, major advantages of that. So as manufacturing needs and processes change, there is no that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you could. I mean, especially something like this conveyor application, if you wanted to have this conveyor application tend another machine, another machine doing the same process, yeah. I mean, you could probably do it within 30 minutes, two hours, max two hours. But, you know, the big thing is going to be if, if you need to outfit it with, with a different type of tooling. And then even if you, even if you do have to uh, outfit with different type of tooling, like, that conveyor top module you see there uh, is four bolts and I think two plug connectors. And then it's it's ready to take that whole top module off and then slap on another one to get maintenance, just do like a tool chain. I mean, some a lot of companies do you know the robot tool changes, you know, manually still. Um, so yeah, it's maybe 30 minutes at most that you get the top module off and get on like a hook module or a palletizing module. Type. Your company mainly delivers these systems as the initial setup, and then you're kind of so. It depends on what the customer level is. I mean, we'll sit there with it, you know, like these, like some of these conveyor applications. Uh, we've we've done all the initial control stuff. We did the panel builds on them. Uh, we went and installed them, did like some conveyor assembly on site, uh, got it up and running basically a couple of days with all the setup things that needed to take place. And then we set with the, we set with the AMR while it ran for a week. Um, and so this is all based on what the customer request is. And then say first, we had one of our customers that gave us calls, Hey, it's exactly wonky. It's kind of, you know, Keeps faulting out with it, kept stalling out whenever uh, it's going around a corner, kept seeing the corner and it didn't know what to do with it. It was a tight area, right? It was trying to operate in. So then we just came back in there. And uh, I think for that one there, we just included it as part of our part of our capital install, right? We didn't charge anything for that service and like that. Um, but we just came in, we basically taught it a, a, a tighter path. Where it wasn't allowed to be equals had as much, and then that was the solution for that problem. Good. More questions? Well, we want to actually thank Kyle and Mel for being here, and Mel Peck came from Evansville, and Kyle came from Indy. Indy. So, thank you. I know some of you came from, from some other locations as well, so thank you for coming. So we do have some food and, and drinks out here available, and it's it's from Purdue uh, MEP is sponsoring that. So help yourselves with that. We want the conversations to continue talking. Obviously, he has a, a large robot out there that he's going to show you. So please continue to ask those questions. Uh, again, I'm with the Westgate Academy here, so so we do these types of events. Um, we do larger events. We have a very large conference center that's by, that's behind here that can seat 800 people. Uh, and we just had a large event last month of the Autonomous Day. It was our second year that we have done it. So we have demos, displays, vendors, people, business. So, so kind of look for us um, with, with what we're doing from events. I think it would be beneficial for some of you to potentially attend again. Uh, what you have on your, on your desk here is what we are doing next month for the first Tuesday. It's an Indiana Defense Manufacturing Forum. It's, it's going to be new. Uh, Andy Alexander is a procurement technical assistant person within Southern or South Central Indiana. So he's developing a defense forum with manufacturers to specifically for the net, for innovation within the national security of the defense area. So, so again, it'll be, it'll be here at the Academy, same format as that we're doing here, but um, so it would be great to see you guys here as well. So. So again, thank you guys very much for coming and we can all spill out into the, the lobby there and, and have some drinks and food and some conversations. So.